as usual we've had sun for a while now and I've decided to work on the cabinet and because I've decided to work on the cabinet it has decided to rain okay so we're going to get into the chassis and we're going to get all this dust off it I would love to blow it off with a compressor but my compressor is a petrol one and it lives over in the barn and it's currently buried under some stuff so until I get a decent air compressor I'm really stuck with just wiping this down manually we'll um, get this dust off which should just come off you'll see it just roll off there and there's some light surface rust underneath that I'll have to try and get rid of as well now you may hear a helicopter in the background that's one of our neighbors who has a deer farm of sorts I think what he's actually got is just a place to breed deer and then let them out around the neighborhood because there are deer everywhere he's done a great job of repopulating the wilderness and I think his helicopter is how he tries to get them back I think it's just an excuse to fly in his helicopter I'm sure if I had a helicopter I'd look for an excuse to okay so take the valves out they're gonna get a bit of a clean because they're a bit nasty before I put it back in I will try and tidy these up uh, sorry before I try and put that valve back in and this one too pays to be really careful when you're pulling these off I mean these aren't too bad they're quite loose so they're certainly not corroded into place but the valve caps are only glued onto glass and they will quite happily disconnect themselves from the glass and if you're unlucky they'll break through the wire that feeds through the glass into the grid and if that happens you've either got to throw the valve away or I have seen some very keen soles chip away at the glass until there's just enough wire to solder to create a little hoop in the end of the wire and lay it down on top and then solder it on then carefully put the cap back on with some JB Weld or Araldite or something like that. They are rescuable. I guess it depends how valuable you consider that particular valve. If it's something really, really common, like a 6K7, then you probably wouldn't bother. Having said that, I don't throw them away because they're common now. 50 or 60 years from now, I imagine people will be chipping away the glass to rescue those valves. If it's not electrically damaged, it's just a physical problem, I do keep them. Okay, I'm pretty sure my neighbour is going to be a complete pain in the ass while I'm doing this. So I apologise for the helicopter noises, but it's either that or I voice over at the end. And I'm barely figuring out how to do this filming, let alone actually voicing over. So to tidy this up, uh, I'm going to have to take this grid cap off. Now, it almost looks brazed, but it will just be soldered. There's two metal tabs so all they've done is with the end of this they've cut a slot into it and then folded the two metal tabs over and this wire is just hooked under one of them so I'll need to uh, apply some heat and then just prise that tab up desolder it, I'll put some heat shrink over the wire and then put it back on uh, that will tidy that one up this one this one's in a little bit worse shape because the wires actually go up He's gone now so we'll get back to it this one's going to be a little bit more difficult this is the one for the 6a8 and we're not easily going to be able to heat shrink that really well we could but it's the, the wires broken in a couple of well the insulation's broken in a couple of spots uh, but the grid caps the same so it should be easy enough to get off so we'll take that off I'll replace the wire and then put it back on a new piece of wire or new old piece of wire or find something appropriate in terms of the aerial and earth wires same story I do have some reproduction wire and I'll probably just put a length of aerial wire on it because these sets really need aerial wire what they really need is probably a good 30 meters or 100 feet of wire uh, just having a meter or so on these sets makes a huge difference to their capability so the aerial and earth wires are just tied to the chassis with this old piece of string and given the rest of the construction of the set I wouldn't be surprised if that's factory although having said that there's a knot up here where the earth wire is soldered to a fairly hefty lug on the top so it's also possible that actually the aerial and earth wires were just connected by that solder tag and someone's added that string at a later date to give it a wee bit more strength it's hard to say um, I'm not going to change much about that other than just to replace the aerial wire 
All right, so I've got a bit of a stiff bristle brush here. I'm just going to try and take this dust off. Yeah, it's coming off quite nicely. I considered taking the bell off this transformer and giving it a really good going over and a polish, but just looking at it, it's a really horribly rough looking it looks cast and so I can only imagine it was been like that since the dawn of its existence so I don't particularly at this stage want to try and make it something it's not certainly because it's been my plan to not make this set something it's not right from the get-go typically these IF cans if you put a wee bit of love into them they'll polish up beautifully but again it just wouldn't be in keeping with the set I might just check and see if I've got any compressed air in it too left. I can't find the can of compressed air. I think I used it all. I've, it's such a ridiculous product. Air in a can. But right now it would actually be quite handy. So I guess it's not as ridiculous as I considered it. I can't call it a ridiculous product when I actually paid money for it. But I was it was on special and I was curious as to just how good it would be. Uh, and it, it would be really good if it actually lasted more than a few seconds. It's just, I don't know what they charge for compressed air in a can where you come from, but over here it's something ridiculous. Like, when it's not on special, around $12 a can, and it just doesn't last that long at all. This dial will need to come off as well. I'm not sure if you remember back to part one. I barely remember back to part one when I thought I'd have this whole set done in one short video. The knob that's on here is just a knob, and there's a dial pointer which is actually pressed onto the shaft. Now to get that glass off I'm going to have to get that off the shaft without damaging it in such a way that I can't put it back on again. So I need to be a wee bit careful about that. The chassis is looking clean now. It's really rough though. You can see there's quite a bit of rust and pitting in there. I'm not going to repaint this chassis. I'm going to have a, a bit of a scrub with some very fine sandpaper and just see if I can knock the top of the surface rust off and then we'll give it a bit of a clean and then I might put some silicon on a rag and just give the give the chassis a bit of a rub to hopefully stop that from happening in the future or getting any worse in the future. Okay, so I've got some 800 grit wet and dry. Interesting watching David Tipton's latest video and he's talking about the stuff is wet and dry. Wondering if it was actually known as wet and dry or if that was a, a trade name. I must admit I've wondered the same thing since he mentioned that because I've always called it wet and dry as well. Mainly because um, when I was first introduced to this stuff, I was told that you can use it wet or dry. I'm going to use it dry here and just see how that goes. As I said, I'm not trying to sand the paint off or take any layers of material off. I'm just trying to knock down that surface rust. Okay, so it's clogging the paper up. You can see there a bit of a bash on the edge of the bench. I'm going to try with a little bit of isopropyl alcohol and see if that makes a difference. So we're using it wet but we're using an alcohol rather than water. So again just being really really light in my action I'm not trying to take anything off here. Okay, so the surface now feels beautifully smooth. There's still a bit of surface rust on there. If this was America, I'd use some naval jelly on it. This is not America, we can't get naval jelly here. I have had some success in the past using some rice paper soaked in uh, vinegar and then just laying the rice paper on it. Now, I, I used the rice paper basically to stop it from evaporating so fast, but the downside was that the pattern in the rice paper ended up etching itself into the chassis which wouldn't have been so bad but it was a chrome chassis and so it kind of left weird marks at least they were kind of repetitive and almost looked like they they kind of belonged there I think this is going to work fine in terms of tidying up this particular part of the chassis won't be seen which is why I started here because if it all goes horribly pear-shaped at least it's an invisible part off the radio to all intents and purposes. It feels much better. I'm just going to zoom you in on it. I'm just having the devil's own time trying to get this thing to focus down. 
it probably doesn't look hugely better, it feels immensely better, but there's still quite a bit of rust on that surface and that's simply because um, the rust creates some, some heaps and then it creates some pits as well. And what I've done is knocked the rust off the, the mounds and probably forced it into the pits whilst knocking everything smooth. So while it feels really nice, there's still quite a bit of rust visible. And the way that I think I'm going to have to deal with that is to put some kind of de-rusting agent on there. So I'm going to give that a bit of a go again in this area because if it screws up then at least it's not visible to the outside. So the stuff I'm going to use is this, it's just some whatever was cheapest at, at Bunnings or Mitre 10 when I got it. Kiwis and Aussies will know what those are. If you're from the States, probably Home Depot equivalent here. I found it works really really well. I've also tried some other stuff. Most of them seem to do the job. Um, they appear to just be a mild acid. Now they do tend to work better warm and strangely enough and I'm sure there's some chemistry experts who can explain why but the instructions say to dilute this in water and I've actually found it works better when diluted with a bit of water. Kind of weird. I'd be interested to know what that was. Now I can feel the surface roughing up again which tells me that this is biting into the rust and you can see it's coming off on the cotton bud. So I think it's biting into the rust and getting it out of those pits. The, the surface is no longer as smooth as it was when I started. So I'm going to give that a little while. I mean, there's certainly something coming off there onto the cotton bud. But I'm not going to sit here for a couple of hours and do that. So you should be able to see the, the cotton bud's pretty grubby. We'll come back and see what difference, if any, that made. It's been a couple of hours. Um, it's converted the rust to uh, black material, which is what rust converter does. I don't know if the sand is going to be necessary, it may be better off to leave it. But that's actually done the job, it's taken the rust away. And I think if we put a, a wax coating or something on top of that when we're done, that'll, uh, that'll come up quite well. Alright, so while I'm waiting for that, I'm just going to look into getting this dial glass off. I want to be fairly careful with this pointer because um, it backs onto the glass. I can't get the glass off without getting the pointer off and the pointer almost looks like it's soldered onto the shaft. It's going to be quite difficult to show you so I'm just going to get a picture of that. Only on the one side. I'm just going to see if I can break the solder because actually desoldering it's going to be quite difficult. There we go. Absolutely crazy cheap ass way to do a pointer. I'll probably use a spot of just some rubbery type glue to put that back on. I'm not going to put it back on with solder again. Alright, so that's our dial off. Um, I should be able to slip that glass out of this backing plate. You can see to fit the, um, <laughs> fit the on off switch in. They've just utterly mangled this. It hasn't been done nicely at all. If I ran that there or there across my finger too hard, it would cut. It's It's been done with some jagged tin snips by the feel of it. And uh, that's not very nice at all. So um, we'll give that a wee bit of a tidy up just for, for safety reasons. I'm going to get this glass out. Hopefully it will slip out. Yep, 
and I'll give that a clean. Um, the backing paper, it's just just a black paper. So I think I've got some black paper I can replace that with if it needs it, but it should be okay. Uh, really all I want to do is clean the glass. Careful not to clean the ink off the glass. That would be bad. But we'll give it a bit of a clean up. Also careful not to drop it. Ask me about that time I tripped over the power cord of a radio I was working on and smashed the glass and then got a replacement glass and smashed that too. Actually don't ask me about that, I don't want to talk about it, but uh, let's just be sure not to do it with this one. So I'm going to clean that with um, some isopropyl alcohol and a rag. Sometimes these water soluble inks, uh, well not all of them are water soluble, but uh, sometimes uh, like an isopropyl alcohol will do less damage, strangely enough, than what water will do. Uh, I did have a guy email me recently with uh, a set that he'd been working on, <laughs> beautiful dial on it, reasonably rare set, not valuable, but reasonably rare, and he uh, had washed the dial glass and he said the whole the whole dial scale, the everything just slid straight off, uh, which would be horrifying, I'm sure. I'll go and clean this dial and I'll be right back. Um, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see this easily, but that's a million times better. Unfortunately, you'll notice a little bit between 800 and 900 kilohertz where the gold just flaked off. It, it, didn't wash off and actually just flaked off so I'm not quite sure if I've got a paint that color that I can actually try and rebuild that with but I'll have a crack with something and just see if I can fill that in make it look less obvious uh, one of the things you may be able to see and you can certainly feel it on the back I don't know if it's going to focus or you'll be able to see it but you can see lines either side of where that gold was now this is a um, an etched glass dial which for edge-lit dials is, is kind of an important feature. They, they etch into the glass and so that the ink actually sits inside the glass, if you like. It's, it's in from the back. It's not just painted on the back of the glass. So uh, that'll give me some lines to work to, to try and get it in there. And we'll just uh, we'll see how that comes out. OK, what I've got here is some gold porcelain paint. So I may just do a little test spot in the corner. It's probably not too far off the colour. It's quite gludgy, so it looks like it will actually stick to it. It'll be interesting to see when it dries. It's probably closer to the colour of the Rolex writing than it is the dial pointer at the moment, but we'll see as it dries, I expect it will lighten up a little bit. Trimmed uh, one of these cotton buds to a fine point. So I'm going to give it a go. Nothing to lose. A situation where it was looking okay and you thought I'll just add a bit more and then wish you hadn't but I think once it dries and I'm not sure if this is going to show up very well let's just grab the black background and try not to get the reflections in it so the color match isn't perfect but it's not too bad uh, my attempt at sticking in the lines well that's just abysmal but uh, because it's etched I'm hoping I can just scrape that off once it dries a little bit and just tidy that up. I'll give this backing a dust off I don't think there's any particular reason to replace it. Tidy that up, no more sharp edges. Uh, is it pretty? No. Is anything on the set pretty? No. We're getting pretty used to that now. Let that paint dry for a while before we go 
putting everything back together. Sort of white crazing. I'm not sure if that's showing up on the camera, but when I'm cleaning the rust converter off, it's leaving a bit of a white crazing on the, the surface, which I'm not totally enamoured with, but that may... If we put some wax or something on top of this when we're done, silicon or wax, that should actually blend that out. Yeah, it'll be fine. So I'm going to carry on cleaning up around here, just get all this surface rust off, then we'll treat it, and then we'll coat it. I do need to remove this can to get that wire out and replace it, um, but I shouldn't have to bend these tabs up. I should be able to just undo the two nuts on the, on the bottom side and this one on the top, and then lift it up once I've disconnected the, um, the grid cap lead. Now, there's something worth mentioning while I'm cleaning in here. If you've got crackling while you're tuning, that can often be caused by dust or debris in between the plates of your tuning gang. Um, the rotor or the stator, they, they both get filled with dust over time. And so what you really want to do is get in there and get all the dust and crap out. Now sometimes that's easier said than done. This is nice and dry. Um, the little fur balls and, and stuff that have been in here have been quite easy just to wipe out and they've uh, they've just gone away. If uh, if that's not the case, if you've got uh, sometimes you get corrosion on the plates and you actually have to get in there with something much more substantial than a brush uh, between each plate and either knock those down. One thing people do like to do is actually take these off and put them in a dishwasher and I believe something about the alkalinity or acidity, I'm not quite sure which of the of dishwashing liquid will actually clean these plates up really really well, but not necessary at this particular point. That noise indicates something's rubbing, so you also want to stop that because rubbing is bad. Right? These plates need to be close to each other but not touching. And so what's actually the case here is I've bent this wire while I've been cleaning and it was just rubbing. So it's just an earth wire that runs down under the chassis from this solder point here down through. Rubbing generally on a tuning gang means that the plates are shorting. If the plates are shorting, then your tank circuit formed by the tuning gang and the aerial coil will do nothing. Uh, it means you just won't be tuning anything. So really really important to make sure there's no rubbing in there. You'll find dead spots in your tuning band if you do have rubbing like that, uh, which is generally a good indication, but you stick your ear down behind it and just turn it full range. You'll hear if anything's rubbing. Be aware if you start bending these plates, unless you're bending them back exactly where they were, you're going to change the way the tuning gang reacts at certain points. Um, it can stretch or compact certain parts of your band and make the radio not quite tuned the way maybe you'd expect it to. That was probably really, really important back in 1938-39 when this radio was built because people expected 3YA wherever you were in the country. 1YA was Auckland, 2YA Wellington, 3YA Christchurch and 4YA was in Dunedin, which are the four main centres across New Zealand. Um, and the YA stations were the big ones, they were the government controlled stations that, that had big power output. You knew where they were on the dial, the dial indicated that. So you can see uh, there are some ZB stations, um, but the 1YA, 2YA over on the right hand side of the dial, 3YA just down from 1YA, and then 4YA is just past that. So they're all over on the right hand side of the dial there. They did move around a bit, stations moved, frequencies changed, and sometimes actually looking at where those main stations are, or the stations on the dial are, can give you an indication of the age of the set, or at least an age range. People would quite often use the bottom half of the dial rather than the top half. They didn't care what the frequency was, they just knew that on the dial, if they were in Dunedin, 4YA was down the bottom, sort of at about 5.30, and that's what they would tune the station to. Until you start bending these plates, and maybe 4YA shifts a little bit, and that, you know, some people wouldn't care, and some people would be quite annoyed by that. You can see the split rotor plates on the outsides, and those were to help tune or fine-tune certain parts of the band by increasing or decreasing the capacitance in certain areas of 
of rotation. So you will see these tweaked. Do not try and think, oh, someone's bent that, I'll straighten it back up again. Because quite often they're bent for a reason. Right? None of them are bent on this, which tells me that they threw it in and went near enough's good enough. But certainly on sets from major manufacturers, the likes of uh, Radio Corp BNZ, Radio Limited, Acrad, Collier and Beale, those, those big manufacturers would have had rigorous testing procedures for their radios before they went out the door. Uh, they went on, every radio went on a test bench and was run up and um, aligned and checked before it went out the door. And so if there were any alignment issues, they you will find plates that are tweaked out slightly to, to fix those issues. Now that's my understanding of these plates. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, so just a quick update, and I've got a better photo of this, but this wire, which I thought was tan or yellow, typically for wire of this age, you can probably see down here that uh, it's actually green, or was green. So not only is it falling apart, as soon as you bend it, it just breaks like that, but it's the wrong colour. It's actually quite typical for this wire to be green, the grid cap wires. That was a common colour choice back in the day, so I just thought I'd have a look through my odds and ends box to see if I've got any green wire. It's got a volume wire that's typically green inside the inside the shield, which it is, but I don't really want to pull that apart if I can avoid it, because it's nice to have. Um, there's another bit of that which is also green. But what I've discovered over the years is that green is probably one of the colours that survives the least. So it's going to be unlikely that I'll have old green. I've got this new green, but that's solid core, so I don't particularly want to use that. So, based on that, unless you're screaming at the screen and saying, there's some green, you can't see it. I don't know that I actually have any. Now, does it really matter? Could I get away with some other colour? Probably. And I probably will, because the only other alternative I've got... So I was going to say that the only other alternative I've got is this new green, uh, which just, you know, so compared with the old stuff, it's perfect, but it's just a little bit too perfect, I think, for this set. The other option I do have is this green wire here, which is the remnants of the earth wire, which I took off. And I think what I'll probably do is check and see if there's enough of that to replace this wire. So I don't need a lot, maybe 10 centimeters at, at most. And if all else fails, in my new wire box, I did find this, which is, looks like Philco speaker wire, but it's hard to actually say where it came from. I don't recall but uh, that would probably do the job as well. It's not solid green, obviously. It's got a white trace through it, but it would look fine in there, I think. All right, so I went with that second-hand wire. Um, it's a little bit hard to tin, but it does tin, and it does take solder. And so that's fitted up fine. I was going to use the earth wire because it's a solid green, but as you can see, as soon as you bend it, the insulation just smashes open, so it's it's knackered. So that one's for the bin, and uh, that one's what I've chosen to fit. Yeah. Last job of this uh, repair, rejuvenation if you like, it's certainly not a restoration, is to go through the cabinet and decide what we're going to do with it. Now, it's not in that bad a condition. It's a bit dinged, it's a bit scraped. Uh, there's a lot of scratching around the dials, which is fairly common. It looks like it's had something sharp smack it quite hard here and shatter the lacquer. There's definitely damage around these front corners and, and along the bottom here where the lacquer has just gone. All the veneer seems to be reasonably intact apart from this corner here. On the top, we just really have what looks like aging and maybe a little bit of water staining but the top's actually in fairly good condition really the sides look okay 
both sides to me look in fairly good condition. For its age certainly, I don't feel like I want to refinish this cabinet. If, as I go on with different radios, I'm going to do plenty of cabinets where I will fully refinish them. This one to me has some age and some patina if you like. Well, it speaks to its age and it speaks to the type of radio it is. Like the decision I had to make about how far I went under the chassis, my gut feel right now is that I can tidy this cabinet up with its original finish in its original state and not do too much to it and still have a really nice radio. I'm going to do a bit of a test application of some dark oak coloured furniture wax just to see if that tidies up these areas where the finish is gone. We're still sticking in this top corner, but there is no screw heads in there. It may be a brad nail or something that was put in to originally hold it while I was screwing it in place. Oh, keep trying. It'll come out. Yeah, so there was one screw just here. You can probably see and the head of it is definitely not here which means it's underneath that panel. So what I may do is just chip out this uh, trim panel that the speaker screws to, remove the screw, tidy up the hole where it went in and put maybe a match head or something in there that just bulks that hole up again so I can screw back into it. In terms of this speaker cloth uh, you can really see here where it has sagged. It's been a contact adhesive by the, by the feels of things that they've used and it's just sagged down either over the years or it, it sagged down as soon as it was made. It's a really good indication of what the cloth originally looked like under here and it's quite faded as, as is fairly typical for these sets. Given that it's glued in I'm probably not going to be able to reverse it without tearing it to shreds so what I'm going to do is try and just cut underneath here and cut this glue free and then just pull it up straight, re-glue it and I'll try and very very carefully clean it but it, it's quite a loose cloth and if I try with anything and anything aggressive in terms of brushing it I, I think I'm just going to end up pulling threads and, and wrecking it so what I do here I'll do very carefully and if it works it works and if it doesn't work well then it stays dirty. Alright so this is the stuff I use Brywax or Brewax depending how you say it I call it Brywax it's a dark oak stained wax this stuff is great on a warm day because it's nice and soft and runny and easy to apply. Which is not to say it can't be used on a cold day, it's just not quite as easy to use I don't think. So let's just So that's it rubbed in just in that corner and it's just darkened, darkened it up, certainly darkened up the areas where the scratches are. So I think that's going to work nicely so we'll just keep working along the bottom here. Uh, just got a little bit of, looks like a giant fly poo. So I'm just taking that off. There is the odd little speckle of white paint as well. Which can be an absolute pain to get off because the paint is often harder than the or harder to remove than the finish. And it's quite possible that this will darken up a little bit as the stain seeps in. So the wax is carried in a solvent which helps keep it liquid, I guess. 
it's not quite liquid, but it's carried in a solvent and that solvent flashes off. Uh, it's certainly not stuff you want to use in a uh, confined space. I just have a crack with some 4 aught steel wool or 4 zero steel wool which will just scuff the surface up a bit and help them help the wax bite in. It also helps polish it really nicely because uh, it knocks all the nibs off. So it's making a really good difference in the, the tone of the top of the cabinet. It's certainly not fixing issues around the um, UV staining and possible water staining. I don't know what's caused this on here. Could just be rubbing things sitting on top of it. Well, um, we'll just carry on and do the rest of the top here, I think. And, and we'll uh, see how it looks when it's done. And I think that's pretty much going to do us for the cabinet. I don't think it's going to need a whole lot more. I'm quite pleased that this is probably going to retain a lot of the originality of the radio whilst cleaning it up, making it look really nice. So that's what we're going to go with. I'll just keep chugging away here and um, come back when it's time to give it a bit of a polish. The, the wax is fairly dry. Um, it definitely has a waxy feel to it, which we need to buff off. So I'm just going to give that a go and we'll see what happens. Really just a case of smoothing the, smoothing the wax out and that's just a good rub. Now I'm not sure if it's showing up on camera just what a difference that's made to the finish. But it's brought the cabinet back to life. It's given it a really nice feel. There's a little bit of dirt and wax coming off on the, the rag. And I think that's brought the cabinet up beautifully. I'll, uh, I'll do some shots outside later that'll show off the finish a wee bit better, but uh, I'm really happy with that. Um, I love the fact that it's still got this kind of patinaed finish, which you may or may not be able to see. Uh, it still looks like an old radio, but it looks, it looks loved now. So this has had more than five minutes to set up now. It's nice and firm, so we'll get on to the next strip. Okay, so that should hold that in position. Give it a few minutes just to set up, and we'll be back. All right, so that should be dry. Now, this last one is going to be a bit of a pain, and It's as good as it's going to get. Okay. We are just about just that around there out of the way. That's the earth wire. And this is the aerial. screwed in at the back, still got that ridiculous overhang. Uh, I've replaced the odd mismatched screws in the back there with some sort of new old stock period correct ones. Got a couple of felts to go on here, protect the beautiful woodwork.
generally try and have the screws out of the way or out of visible line of sight. So tuning's working, knobs are on, all back in the cabinet. One last go. So I'll just use myself as an aerial, see if we can... Back to business as usual. So there's that electrical noise. Now one thing I've actually thought about is during a lockdown I've got my office set up at home on the same circuit as the plug that feeds my service bench. It's in the room next door to the garage so it's quite possible that all the computer gear, the monitors, everything I've got in there are actually causing some of this noise. So there we go. The edge lit dial looks really good. I'll bring you down for a closer look at that since we're in here in the dark and then I'm going to take it outside and get a couple of photos. Alright and that's it, thanks for watching. That is the end of the restoration or rejuvenation of this Rolex 5 valve broadcast band set from around 1939. There will be another video coming shortly and that's going to be a slightly more interesting set, one from the Pacific Radio Limited stable based out of Wellington in New Zealand. So stay tuned for that one. Thanks for watching.